here you go. Recording in progress. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is our very last uh, online session for this semester and like for, for you all. Um, today I have Keith Haggard with me. So welcome Keith and thank you for sparing time for us. Um, so I start with uh, um, acknowledging traditional owner of the land where we meet and study and do all our businesses. And I <clears throat> respect my, I pay my respect to past, present and emerging. I'm from dark land. So you do, do you Kate, right? And so everybody, yes, um, feel free to uh, put your uh, <clears throat> land in the chat and Okay, so I just want to say a, a few words about uh, Keith and how I know him and all of that. So uh, there is a there is an association called uh, ASCILIT, which is Australian Society for Computers in uh, in Learning in Tertiary Education, and uh, they have. Uh, many special interest group and there's one that is learning design special interest group that uh, Keith uh, and myself co-lead. So we are colleague working together on <clears throat> something like uh, creating a community of practice in, in the area of learning design. Um, Keith is a lecturer at uh, UTS and he has designed and he is running a course uh, which is graduate certificate in learning design. And Keith has lots of awards. Keith, if I, if I start telling about your achievements, then probably I'll take another 15 minutes, which will be very late. So I will let you um, say a few words about yourself before you start as well, Keith. So over to you. All right, awesome, cool. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, where is Larrakia country? Darwin. Ah, okay, fantastic. I've been to Darwin, um, but not for a very long time. <laughs> All right, can everyone see my presentation? Yep. All right. I, I do have a, a confession to make, uh, and I'll begin with that. And I know um, uh, Kashmir is probably going to cut this out of the recording, <laughs> but I was trying to explain to, to Kashmir that I lost the PowerPoint file, and I never lose anything. I have the, the most, you know, over-the-top filing system, but I managed to lose the PowerPoint file, Um that that this presentation is so we're doing it off the pdf and you'll notice that i haven't even updated it so it is not the 10th of january 2022 it is the 20th of february 2023 um but so actually, the topic is the same actually you are not wrong because your uh, first time when we scheduled your uh class that was on 10th february so uh, january so probably uh, you were right <laughs> <laughs> anyway the topic hasn't changed we're still going to talk about this um and I don't know how um, Kashmira does her sessions, uh, but I, I like to get a little bit of involvement. And there's only like five of us in the room, so we can have actually have a really good chat. Um, so who's a gamer, right? Tell tell me, who, who, who's into games? I, I can see Joy is absolutely refusing to shake her head, but she's shaking it in such a way that I reckon she knows people who are gamers. <laughs> Georgia, what was your, your game of choice? You can turn on your mic or you can type it in. It's up to you. I don't mind. Yeah. What What did you play? Come on. Give me some details. <laughs> I love it. Yes. All right. It was my siblings and I, we had the Nintendo 64. It was the first console that my parents bought us. And um, the Mario Kart. <laughs> nice. Yep. Still a classic. Still there. Yeah. We still have it. We, my, my brother ended up inheriting, so to speak, the, uh, the 64. <laughs> One of one of the things uh, that is completely unrelated to gamification is I'm I, I do little physical computing. Have you ever heard of Raspberry Pis? These tiny little credit card sized computers that only cost like twenty bucks, and they've got all the the pins exposed, so you can hook up all kinds of things to them. And one of the things you can do is you can recreate uh, a Super Nintendo console. It's called Retro Pi, and and you know you can get the the old game pad and you can play the games on it it's great fun um yeah cool so we've got no people who are into board games in the room and you know any any scrabble aficionados or, oh so you you some... mean any game like any sort of game or just uh electronic well, sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I deliberately let in with that because I know people think gamers think people think online gaming and Fortnite and so on, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I play chess. I play chess. Really? Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, there are other. Um, um, it's uh, it's kind of a board game, but it's like a, a, a what is it called? Uh, so. Uh, so the version that we used to play was uh, a cloth, which is of like a, a plus shape. And there are lots uh -huh. of uh, houses uh, on, on, so it is like this and four player can play. And we have a, a seashell like those, uh, you know, um, and uh, to count as like not, we didn't have those dices or anything. And uh, yeah. we have colors. So like uh, four people have four different colors and they have, um, four wooden whatever that is that you go through those houses and houses define different things so normal plain square is just nothing you go through and there is a one with the square where you can't be killed by others and you know um, and then you go through everything and then you come in the middle to mature you know and and whoever has all four in the middle first um, they win fantastic and, I, and yeah. I still have it because my mother created that with the yeah. cloth and she embroidered those uh, squares on that cloth. Wow. Well, we're going to come back to some of the things you've mentioned in that because that's actually a really good uh, introduction to some of the elements of gamification. Abby, Abby, sorry if I said that wrong. You, you say yeah, Monopoly. Yes. Do you know the history of Monopoly? No, I don't. Oh, my goodness. I, I tell this to everybody because it is like... So sad. <laughs> um, the person who invented Monopoly uh, was this like diehard socialist, you know, equal distribution, you know, capitalism is bad. And they invented Monopoly to try to show how eventually, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and we're all going to get screwed, right? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, if you look into the history, it, you know, you can make sense of it, you know. They deliberately tried to ruin the game in such a way that it was almost unplayable. And, and you know, certain people always won. And they couldn't do it. And now it's this <laughs> love game about spending money and buying property. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, what's the point? <laughs> but that's another really interesting point about you can design gamification experiences, but people might take the wrong message from them, <laughs> or at least not the message you intend, you know, right? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, let's move on. So this is me. Okay, now now we've warmed everyone up. We can do the introduction. Uh, I think I think Joy has put the dog down there. <laughs> you get bonus points for bringing your puppy dog to to class. Um, He's a foster dog, and I just picked him up. But my husband's home now. He'll look after him. I, hey, if the dog gets something out of my session, good for the dog. <laughs> so uh, as 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 uh, Kashmir said, I'm a, a lecturer at UTS. Um. Before that, I was a high school teacher and a school leader and a primary school teacher, and I've taught in Australia and the UK, um, and I've taught in all the sectors. I think I've taught taught in um, the Catholic sector, I've taught in the independent sector and the public sector. Um, and basically, if there's something that you can get a badge for, um, especially an online course, I am there for it, okay? <laughs> so, so I think they call me a Google Certified Innovator. Have you seen those courses? Do them. You, you know, when you go into classrooms, you will be using Google Classroom, whether you think it's bad or not. Pretty much every jurisdiction in Australia has got it. Go and get your Google Level 1 and Level 2 qualification. It's free. Uh, it might not be free. I think it costs you maybe five bucks to do the exam. I'm an Apple Distinguished Educator, which is always good fun. They fly me all over the, the place. Where did I go last? Um, uh, San Diego I went to. I went to Cork in Ireland, which seems like a random place, but... Big Apple headquarters in Cork. I think it's a tax thing. Um, where else have I been? Indonesia, Bali, which was nice. Very nice. Uh, and uh, also the Adobe stuff. I love love a bit of Adobe. I'm not great on Photoshop, but a few of the other things I'm, I'm pretty good on. Uh, yeah, and I'm a terrible ukulele player. And last year I promised Kashmir that I was going to sing her a song on the ukulele. I will not. <laughs> Even with a year's practice, I'm still no better. You know, it's one like of those things. Yeah. It's one of those things that, like, 
I'm going to stick with it, even though I'm terrible at it. You know, like my wife is brilliant on the piano and singing, and I think my children are as well. And I'm like the tone deaf idiot in the back. <laughs> I'm not quite tone deaf, but I'm not far off. Anyway, that's me. Um, so let's have a quick example of uh of what is gamification or what might be gamification. What we're going to talk about? Who knows about Duolingo? All right, Joy, Joy, talk to me about Duolingo. Oh, yeah, I've tried this one. Um, I've been to Paris twice in the last, like, I don't know, six years or so, and I tried to learn French. And this was just like we took French lessons, but this was really good just for, like, um, uh, refreshing. And it kind of has given me some idea of what, like, the, you know, when they, I guess they adjust it. When What do they call it? When they adjust your, you know, your. Differentiate it. No, no, like when you're doing it and they kind of like move you up or down <laughs> depending on your answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, adaptive learning. Yes, thank you. That's the one I'm looking for. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I, I still like it. I've I've tried learning Italian lately. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I, 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 use... I, I, I... Sorry? Was that someone? I was going to say, the, the Duolingo thing interests me because I'm doing a language as my major with teaching and it's interesting the research behind the Duolingo sort of apps into the classroom. Keep talking. Um, Keep, tell us it, about the research. Yeah, so I use one called Unki, and it, it is science scientifically driven to, it's just repetition after repetition after repetition. That's all these, these apps are. But to get most out of it, you have to be using it for half an hour every day, otherwise the language just will not stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm interested in how these apps and gamifications work in a classroom because I will be doing language teaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And Duolingo, I'm glad a few people know about it, is a fascinating example because it's got all of the successes of gamification and all of the problems as well, right? Yes. So you can find research papers that say it's the best thing since sliced bread. You know, it's going to put language teachers out of work. It's not. And you can also find people that say it's it's a waste of time. You know, you shouldn't be teaching. And then in Australia and, and some other countries, you, you get to the point where people are like, sir or miss, I already speak three languages. Why do I have to do another language at school? And I'm like, yeah, fair point, right? <laughs> Kashmira. Yeah, um... So what I was saying is that from the from last year, Keith, uh, um, I was inspired by a talk and I started learning Mandarin in Duolingo. Oh, and how long did you stick at it for? Oh, uh, so I I reached uh, uh, like a small sentences level, and uh, I I broke in between, and uh, Duolingo started to threaten me. You know, oh, you're not doing <laughs> this, and I'm angry, and this and that, and I said. You know, uh, well, you know what, what we say in this. So I said, no, I'm not doing it. No, I got busy, but it was interesting. And I, um, but I, I didn't like the approach, honestly, um, the way that it, it goes, because um, if, I mean, you really don't learn because they, uh, as you hover over your mouse on it, it, it shows the answer. So you're not really kind of like being, uh, you know, you're not uh, trying or you're not, and there is uh, no identification of um, uh, of the letters in the beginning. So, and, yeah. they, and they all look the same. I know that like the original Mandarin person wouldn't feel like that, Chinese wouldn't feel like that, but uh, most of the, you know, like they, they all look the same to me and it was very hard for me to remember what, which is what. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all right, interesting. Because, yeah, it, it, it's weird because it doesn't really do teaching. It just does repetition, 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 you know, and, and that's kind of an element of gamification. You fail. All right, start again, you know, but we'll get to that. Um, so in case you don't know, this is a little bit of what it looks like. There's pathways and you get to, this is actually a little bit old now. Um, they, they just did a huge update. And I'll, I'll be honest, I... Uh, I've been sucked into the Duolingo hole. I've got a 1,200-day streak going, okay, on Spanish. Do I think I could go to Mexico and speak Spain, the Spanish? No, but it, I'm just, like, determined to, to keep going. Anyway, so you've got little pathways, and it's broken into these really bite-sized snippets and things like that. 
Um, there's leaderboards, there's me competing against other people and there's different ranks and you go all the way up to, I think, the diamond leaderboard. And and if you if you fall down, you don't earn enough points, you start getting these really passive aggressive messages. We miss you. Come back and do some training. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like. Lots of really nice positive reinforcement. They've even started incorporating little videos and little animations. There's some of these really... Um, uh, interesting avatars that appear and say, hey, great job, or five in a row, high five, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you know, positive reinforcement, we all know that works, you know. Um, oh, okay, yeah, and we've already talked about the kinds of things that you notice about Duolingo and, and the value of it. And I think, I think Duolingo is a, a fantastic example of, of an approach to gamification that it's hard to argue with its success in terms of popularity, right? There, there are millions upon millions of people who use it. There are more people who use Duolingo to learn a language than there are learning the language, learning a language in the whole of the US public school system, right? Which is, that's success. But the question is, has it achieved its learning outcomes? You know, so there's business success and then there's learning success. And that's where I start to go, mm, I'm not entirely convinced, but we'll get to that. All right. So what makes a game? You think about everything that you do, and 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 we're not talking about gamification. All right. Duolingo is a good example of gamification, but I want to take you back a couple of steps and say, Gamification is based on games. So what is a game? Well, it's actually hard to define, right? Um, people talk about games having to be artificial conflict. You have to compete against someone. But there's plenty of games where you work to cooperate with someone rather than that. <laughs> um, Kashmir, you're just showing off now, right? <laughs> um. Wow, that's incredible. Um, well, it's not because I think it is a relative concept because my husband knows seven. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm feeling very, very um, uh, underachieving here. <laughs> I mean, uh, so much of it is is a cultural thing, though. You know, if you grow up in a family uh, or a, a culture that is diverse, you and, will and learn I, lots of it. And I, I can tell you, Keith, it's uh, um, here because it's kind of like a, the whole Australia is monolingual. Otherwise, if you go to India, I mean, no matter who you are, like uh, even if you are like a, uh, you know, uh, normal, like let's say you were illiterate, you would still speak about like at least two languages, very fluently writing, reading everything, and uh, you would know a little bit of English. Yeah. I, I had a, a master's PhD student no, master's by research student, sorry, who was writing about the Indian, Indian education system, which is just a, you know, the numbers blow my mind in that respect. But he was talking about a move from being a bilingual education system to trilingualism. You know, this idea that by the time people graduate, they will all be fluent in three yeah. different languages. You know, so there's the local language and then there's one of the larger language, yeah, languages. Yeah, national like language Hindi it's called. It's called English. national language. Uh, so Hindi is like, it's like a uniting language. Everybody's supposed to know it. And every region has its own language. So they will know the regional language as well as Hindi, which is like a, a national language. And English, like almost everybody would know, like uh, bits and pieces, if not very fluent. And, uh, and and I, I remember I learned uh, four languages in, in primary and say throughout my primary and secondary, because we used to learn Sanskrit as well, which is I, I learned until year 12. And I can yeah. I can read, write and understand what I can't speak. That's why I didn't include it. Otherwise, it would be five. Yeah. Uh, Georgia, interesting point. Uh, come on, uh, Abhi, I want you to tell us what the five that you can speak are. Yeah, sure. So I can speak English, Hindi. Uh, Marathi, uh, Malayalam, and Kannada. So these are like languages. And because my parents migrated like every five years, every state that I had to go to at the school, it was mandatory to learn that language. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's how my husband know it as well, because they, they moved from state to state and wherever they went as a, and, and children, you know, they have a, a tremendous receptivity of language. So they, they learned and they speak, uh, you know, language like mother tongue and there are like several of them that's like really amazing yeah yeah i mean 
<laughs> they call India the land of a thousand languages, don't they? Yeah, I've heard that. Um, but Georgia, it's really interesting what you say about Australian system. I don't know so much about universities. You're, you're probably right about that. But in schools, it's a little more complex because for a long time, people used to say, oh, it's just because, you know, Australia, white, kind of boring, no one wants to learn a language kind of thing. But increasingly, it's because a lot of people already speak another language, you know, so they don't see the value in learning another one at school, you know. So so my brother's wife is Vietnamese, and so she speaks Vietnamese. And, and at school, they wanted her to learn Italian or something, and she was like, why? You know? <laughs> I've got two. I'm, I'm doing all right. And you guys, you got more than that. Anyway, um, let, let's, let's get back to what we're meant to be talking about. Georgia, do you want to say something? Oh no! I was just going to say since since I left school twenty years ago and we had we learnt languages, I've been on and off learning for the past twenty years. It's just mind boggling how many people don't think it's important or see the value of it. It, it probably is changing with our demographic of Australia in itself, but um, I think it's pretty disgraceful. Like I'm in Europe now, and you talk to a European, and they they are like Arby and Kashmir. They speak two or three languages and you just think oh my gosh I'm left for dead <laughs> I just I think there's a slight arrogance and ignorance to some <laughs> to our system in the language learning I'm embarrassed that I don't speak more than two <laughs> I, I, I took I took English school kids on on um school trips away and we go to Denmark and and the people from Denmark would speak better English than English. <laughs> and I, uh, that was a real yeah. you know wake up call <laughs> Eye opener, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, all right, but all right, come on. Kid, kid, I don't think that that's that's uh, uncommon because uh, my my supervisor, when I was doing PhD and when I was writing, and I I gave my draft to him, he would say, "Oh, you write so much better than my uh, you know local students." It, he always used to say that. I think it's just because that when you learn a language as a second or third language. Uh, and you systematically learn grammar and punctuation and everything as opposed to something that you take for granted and you know it because you 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 spoke the language since birth and all that so that makes a difference i think how you approach the language yeah yeah all right well, yeah, that makes sense to me all right can i talk about gamification now <laughs> as much as i've enjoyed this um so what makes a game a quantifiable outcome you got to have a result for a game and and even that i think is up for debate these days so so there's all these uh apps on your phone which are like idle gamers that just keep running in the background while you're not doing or doing something else entirely so i think i think our understanding of what games are is is being changed even now but there's one part that i think makes a game really a game and that's in this final definition down the bottom often eliciting an emotional reaction. The reason we spend, and, you know, not everyone does it, but the reason people sit on the sidelines watching people run into each other at a footy game is because of that emotional reaction. They want to feel a part of it. The reason people gamble is often because of an emotional reaction. The reason people enjoy the gamified aspects of Duolingo is because they get that emotional kick out of it, whether it's the positive reinforcement or that negative kind of stress from, oh my goodness, I better do my, my Duolingo or the owl's going to, you know, commit suicide or something. <laughs> yeah, it's the emotional aspect. You know, we are we are creatures of emotion before we're creatures of rational rational rationality. There we go. All right, so these are the kinds of things that most people say games have, all right? Um, they have a system, a way of scoring. They have players. Maybe one, maybe one against someone else. There's an element of abstraction, okay? So let me give you a really good example of that. Um, I quite enjoy the Assassin's Creed games, okay? Especially the ones set in, in history. So I was playing the ones set in ancient Greece. And in the Assassin's Creed game set in ancient Greece, I can travel from one end of Greece to the other in the space of about an hour in game time, right? Now, obviously, that's not realistic. That would take days. But the level of abstraction makes us easier. And we as the, the gamers, as the, the participants in the game, we accept that that's not real, but we don't let it ruin our enjoyment of the game. What else is there? There's a challenge. There's no point playing a game where it's too easy. We don't value it as much. Um, you know, so if, if Kashmir was learning Mandarin um, and she could do it all from the start, her involvement would be even less than... than 
if it was too hard. Rule, some element of interactivity. This is really important. For us to play a game, we've got to be able to influence the game to some extent. Although what that actually looks like changes from game to game. There's the emotional reaction, some kind of feedback, you know, what went well, what went bad, but not in a not in an educational sense, but certainly in a in an academic uh, in a uh, emotional sense. All right, so that's games. This is gamification, uh, and this comes from a guy called Carl Cap. Um, he he's written a lot about what it actually means to gamify. Um, and and he he makes a difference between games based learning and gamification. I think that the the difference between the two is actually much much blurrier than blurrier than you might imagine. But regardless of that, I think these things are really really important. But I want to highlight the one down the bottom. Okay, promoting learning. If you are going to gamify something, you've got to actually promote learning. Now that might seem really really silly. But it's often overlooked. Um, so let me give you a really simple example of that one. And we'll go back to Duolingo for that one. So I used to work out at Emu Plains, which is like far western Sydney. Um, and I worked with the Japanese teacher. Um, and he was the only Japanese teacher in the school. And he had probably the toughest job teaching a whole bunch of year seven and eight kids, nothing but Japanese for an hour a week, right? It was hardcore. Um, and he would use Duolingo all the time. But eventually he said, Keith, it's just not working. You know, the kids have learned what to click, you know, so they can construct the sentences or click the right thing, but there's no actual learning going on. You know, they've, 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 they've gamified the game, right? <laughs> they've worked out how to, how to get the, the highest score without actually doing the learning. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we see that a lot. You often see this in kind of really unscrupulous behaviour in banks. Um, so banks are famous for paying, you know, really high bonuses for their, their what do you call them? The, no, no, not the shareholders, the advisors, the people who go and give financial advice and sign up new customers and get the old customers to buy new products, right? Um, and, and, you know, in some ways, giving people a bonus is gamifying their work, right? Hey, I get a reward. Yay, I did it. You know, positive reinforcement. Um, but what it leads to is not necessarily people doing the right thing and giving the best advice. It leads to people engaging in, you know, some really dodgy behavior in order to sign people up. Uh, and the whole Banking Royal Commission was kind of about that thing. Um, motivating action. It's got to make you do something, all right? Remember the teaching is what we do learning is what the students do and if we get that round the wrong way um you know we're in trouble and and i always say that the students have got to be the ones who are doing the most work in the classroom because if it's the teachers then i'm not convinced that there's much learning actually happening all right um have you all seen the moscow example Using wheels started as my college project, right, and we now sell our wheel covers all around. Not this. All right, this. You know, I'm always doing this. I rush off to the underground to catch a train, and then when I actually get here, I realise I've left my wallet behind, and I haven't got any money to pay for my journey. Well, from today, that's no longer a problem in Moscow, because now there's another way to get your ticket. And this is how you do it. I agree, it's a little unorthodox, but I think I'll get there in the end if I've got the puff. Now, as you can see, I'm trying to do squats in this rather unusual Russian bending machine. And I'm told that if I can do 30 squats in two minutes, then this machine will actually reward me with a free metro ticket uh, that's worth 30 rubles. Now, this invention is the brainchild of the Russian Olympic Committee. And the whole idea is to uh, encourage a sporty lifestyle for Russians ahead of the Sochi Games. Now, if you think you can fool this invention, think again, because there are special sensors here. And if it doesn't like... It... All right, you get the idea, right? You like that, Arby? You reckon that would work? Well, I'll, I'll have to cancel the gym membership soon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that that's quite an old video, but I, I love it because it's a really great example because people say, yeah, yeah, Keith, but that's not learning, all right? That's not learning, but it is. 
did you hear what he said just before I stopped the video? The aim is to encourage a healthy lifestyle. I mean, it's not school education, but it's certainly adult community informal education. We're trying to shape people's behaviour through gamification, you know? So it's a bit bit of fun, maybe. And it's also a real, there's a reward there, right? Is there an emotional commitment? Oh, probably not, right? But there, there is a, a, an outcome, a definite quantifiable outcome. You will complete or you won't, you know? There's a challenge there. Can you do 30 squats in two minutes? Um, yeah, all right, cool. I'll show you another example. Might be death by YouTube ad to you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, this one. All right, I gotta stop it. <laughs> what do you think of that? I mean, we've all done mandatory fire safety training, right? Do it at the start of every year, and it is horrible. Okay. <laughs> do you think that would be more effective? Eh, maybe, maybe not. I think it's terrible. It's really bad as an example of gamification. You see the guy running? You know, his his little figure is running in the middle of a and I'm like, hang on, I'm not sure you should be running. And the other thing is, you know, there's no smoke around. It's not a good simulation. Um, but but it meets the the category for it to be gamified, right? There's a challenge to overcome. There's a, a quantifiable outcome. Either, you, you know, you end up burnt to death or you manage to safely put out the fires. Um, you know, there, there is learning, I guess, um, you know, so you've got to make sure you use the right fire extinguisher on the right kind of fire. But I also think there's some unintended consequences of learning, you know. Maybe you're learning that it's okay to run around. Maybe you're learning that when there are four fires in your warehouse, it'll be okay because there won't be much smoke around. When in reality, we all know that it's the smoke that's the most dangerous thing, right? Yeah, so that's not a good example. And then, of course, there's this one, which I think is fascinating. Um, and is going through, going through some kind of weird um, re, you know, lots of people are back into Pokemon Go at the moment. Oh, sorry, not that. <laughs> um, but but people are now playing Pokemon Go. Add you through everything you need to know to start your Pokemon Go adventure. Ash Catchem style. So give your mum. Your goal is to catch all to run open to be effective. I'll just show you. There we go. The more chance you'll have of capturing that Pokemon. The ring has different colours as well, indicating the level of the Pokemon. Anyway. um, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. My, my kids are really into Pokemon at the moment, which is why I included this example, just because I like it. But it, it's deeply addictive. It works, you know? So, so it also gets people out and about. So it's a little bit like this Moscow subway example. Sure, we've got to get out there to catch them all, right? Right. But it's also teaching us that we've got to get out and exercise. We've got to walk places. We've got to, and the more we walk, the more rewards we get. So that element of positive reinforcement, rewards, point scoring, leadership, social uh, leaderboards, it's social, is all there, right? So those are just some examples of gamification and whether they're gamification or not. Um, and the effectiveness of them as gamification, I think, is really interesting. All right, let's talk about what gamification is not. Because uh, this is something that I actually go and I talk to HR professionals about a lot. And they, they get me in, um, you know, with my learning designer hat on. And they say, yeah, we had a gamification thing and we're giving people badges and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, and then we stop because people just lost interest, right? <laughs> and it's it's the same kind of thing you will see in your classrooms where you see, um, what do they call it? Reward inflation, right? So you give a kid a sticker if you're a primary school teacher or even a high school teacher, 
you know, the first time they do their homework. And then they will expect a sticker every time they do their homework. Whereas the homework should just be the, the minimum, right? You can't get a sticker for that. Um, or you give the naughty kid uh, a reward when they behave, right? And then everyone else in the classroom is like, we behave all the time. What's our reward? What do we get out of it? So gamification programs in schools, um, and they're common, and, and teachers use them a lot, even when they're not conscious that they're using them, um, are, are, are very, very effective. Although they sometimes kind of run out of steam. So here's what I think, and I should really rename this slide. It's not really what's not gamification. It's what's not bad game, or what, what's not good gamification. If you're just using badges, points, or rewards, it's not going to work, all right? We don't exist in the Harry Potter universe where everyone gets excited when Gryffindor gets five points. Most school children don't care, okay? They'll care for about five minutes at the swimming carnival, and then they don't care, okay? <laughs> um, it needs to be more than that. It's also not about trivialising learning. This is something that you'll come across a lot. If you gamify responses on a test or something like that, your students will very quickly learn how to, to, to get give you the exact answers they need in order to get the most points. But that is not the same as learning everything that they should learn. You know, so so you sometimes see this. If you give your students some, some pre-queuing materials, all right? So you say, we're going to watch a video and I want you to answer these three questions at the end of the video. They'll do really well. They'll be able to answer those three questions at the end of the video. Ask them anything else about the video and they'll be like, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. So, so that's a, a bit of a tightrope act that you've got to be careful of. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Kashmir without actually learning, right? It's not stress-free or easy. It is not the silver bullet. It does not fix behavior issues. If you have behavior issues, it doesn't fix motivation. It won't rapidly turn your children into you know, Harvard scholars or anything like that, okay? It has its place, but not every place. Oh, there you go. Not perfect for every situation. It's also not new, right? People have been playing, you know, Kashmir was talking about chess. I'm fairly certain chess has got a, a like three and a half thousand year old history, at least. Um, and I'm fairly certain, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and gamification doesn't have that much of a history, but teachers have been using gamification for a very, very long time. Um, and it's had, had its place in the corporate workplace and the corporate HR space for just as long. Um, and people include it because in some ways, for some purposes, on some people, it actually works reasonably well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's not new. What else? How do you make it happen in your classroom? So these are the kinds of things that you can include. Let me just, yeah. Um, you need to be very careful about how you do this. And I'm going to point out just one thing that I think is really, really important in doing a good job. Good gamification uses storytelling. Okay, there's no point having points and badges and stickers on the wall or, or you know, <laughs> a house competition unless there's a narrative underpinning it. Remember, as human beings, we respond to story. We we communicate with each other. We are social creatures. And the same is true in your classroom. And if you can convince people to buy into the narrative that you're saying, and I'm not saying, you know, you have to turn your classroom into Lord of the Rings or something like that. But, you know, there, there needs to be an element of a story that students can adopt in order to care, to have that emotional engagement in the, the, the gamification process. Um, if you can do that, that's really successful. The other one I want to point out are replays, right? So if you, um, and th this is something about how games themselves have changed in fascinating ways, right? So so when we were playing the, the Nintendo and you're playing Donkey Kong or Pac-Man or Pitfall, uh, Pitfall was my favourite, um, you had three lives and then you were done, back to the start, right? Nowadays, in games like Call of Duty or you know, those kind of run around and shoot people. Um, if you die, you just go back to the checkpoint and you can just keep going and going and going. The designers of the game realised that that was a more effective way of keeping people involved. So if you're going to use gamification in your classroom, like I'm suggesting, you need to find a way to give ch children 
a chance to fail and start again without being all the way behind the rest of their classmates. Um, because the last thing you want is to split the class between two or three kids who are, you know, succeeding at every challenge and all the rest who don't care anymore because they know they will never catch the two or three um, up the top. Um, time. Have a time element, okay? Put them under a little bit of pressure, but not too much pressure because that'll that'll impact upon the learning. All right. So what kind of theories of learning underpin gamification? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, it's incredibly behavioristic, okay? Especially in terms of that operant conditioning. So not so much the classical conditioning, not the the bell and the dog kind of thing, but but the the kind of stimulus and the unrelated reward. Um and one of the things about operant conditioning is variable reward schedules are the most effective ways of motivating new behaviors. So um, the best example of this from from gaming worlds. Oh no, uh, let, let's do um, let's do <laughs> problem gambling, right? So poker machines don't pay out on every twentieth time you pull the slot or press the button, right? They pay out on a random variable schedule. That actually means people keep coming back, and it works towards you know all those troubling questions of addiction and all that kind of stuff. Um, as a behaviorist, BF Skinner would be like, "Yep, that, that's that's the idea. That's what you're training people to do to 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 you know put their money into poker machines." So with your rewards, you might want to have a variable reward schedule. Don't give the same rewards out all the time. That might lead you open to some accusations of not being fair. So <laughs> approach approach that one with caution, all right? Um, the other thing is the, the ARCS model of motivation. Um, this is more in, in a learning design circles and especially adult education that we talk about. Um, but but it talks about having capturing people's attention, uh, making sure that the learning is relevant um, and giving them the confidence to succeed. The scaffold provided by gamification usually allows the students to be much more intrinsically motivated, if done well, than extrinsically motivated. And that comes back to the narrative idea, that idea of storytelling, you know, give them a reason to do it, that they want to do it, rather than, you know, a carrot or a stick to make them do it. Uh, it also ties in really nicely with distributed practice and, and some areas of cognitive and especially cognitive load theory. So distributed practice is the idea that we should constantly revisit old material. We should activate the, excuse me, the schemas in our minds to make sure that um, it's it's well encoded in long-term memory. Um, and that's why, you know, when you're you're planning your lessons, you should always review the previous material or, and then at the end of the lesson, preview the upcoming material. Well, the repetition that is often inherent in uh, gamification encourages that kind of distributed practice. And it also has elements of scaffolding, you know. So think about um, computer games. Uh, you know, I'm talking about computer games again. But usually in a computer game, there's a tutorial level, you know. They don't throw you onto the hardest level straight away. They give you an easy level and a slightly harder level then a slightly harder level. Um, and that that brings in a sense of challenge as well. But it's also a really nice learning mechanism. You know, we could talk about um, zones of proximal development. Um, and that's something that you should think about trying to include in your, your gamification efforts as well. But it's not perfect, as I said before. Um, doing it right can be incredibly time-consuming. Um, I had a teacher... Um, who was in one of my classes and then she graduated and she got a job. Um, and she was one of those teachers that lived for, I think it was her year four classroom, right? Um, and she created this incredible gamified system all based around Harry Potter, you know? So so she was Mrs. McGonagall or whatever it was. And the, the kids were assigned to houses and they got points and they had, you know, they, they didn't even have normal classes they had potions and they had botany or whatever you know i'm not up to date on my harry potter right and i said to her at the end of the lesson at the end of the the year i said you know how did it go were you really happy with it and she said it was incredible it was the most wonderful experience and i will never do it again because i can't sit up 
till three o'clock, you know, building a sorting hat ever again. <laughs> you know, I just don't have the 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 capacity to do it. Uh, and that's the big thing, all right? People often sell gamification as a as a cheap and easy solution. And 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 it does work in short terms um, with easy options, but but it quickly stops working as well, you know. You, you can only bribe your students so much before uh, you run out of lollies or, or whatever, right? Um, it, it's very costly in terms of your time and the resources required to develop it, okay? And, and I'll be honest, as teachers, you're going to end up spending far too much of your own personal money on things in the classroom because you want that wonderful learning experience for your children. That makes me angry, but I did exactly the same thing when I was a teacher as well. So try to avoid that as much as possible. And of course, it's not suitable for every situation, right? I taught year 12 ancient history for years. Did I ever try to gamify it? No. It was all about getting ready for the exam. Okay. Um, and there are other ways of getting ready for the exam. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't work with adult learners or, or older learners. It does, absolutely. But uh, I think I think when there's high stakes elements involved, I'd probably stay away from it um, and really focus on on much deeper approaches to learning. Yeah. Um, oh, and these are just some of the tools that I really like using for gamification. Um, some of them I'm sure you've heard of, like Kahoot. Uh, everybody loves a bit of Kahoot, but Kahoot is really the most basic element of gamification. All right. Um, things like H5P and Genially actually save you a lot of time. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, all right. I'll just show you genially really, really quickly. Uh, yes, it's me. Let me sign in. All right. Because um, the great thing about genially is that it comes with lots and lots of templates. Um, so you click in here and you say, yes, I'm going to use this template. And this is free, by the way, right? Okay, you got to log in. So they are going to take your data, but, you know, same with everything else, right? Um, but but they'll give you a gamification template. And then you can push that out into the school's LMS or into Google Classroom or whatever you like. Um, you know, so here you go, you know. <laughs> There's a story. Uh, this is a story about dot, dot, dot. And then you can, uh, you can chuck in different images here so you could actually take photos of students probably don't do that i'd use avatars or something like that you could give them real names um and then you know you've got a question and uh you know what is a feature of gamification and then you know you can have right answer wrong answer wrong answer and then you can actually play this and and you just export it as a html really really simple really really good fun it's not even the best one. This one's even better, H5P. Have you heard of H5P? All right. H5P um, is all about HTML5. And the thing that I really like about it is that you can have branching scenarios. So remember how I was talking about the power of narrative? This is how you create branching scenarios in here. So this is just an example, right? Um, oh. Yeah, we're ready. We're ready. Oh, maybe it's only got a couple. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Pay attention, Keith. So you read about a client. You know, this is gamification. This is a scenario, right? <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, so I've read about her. What do I do next? Oh, well, that's wrong. <laughs> anyway, you can see, and, and depending on the choices you make, you will have different outcomes and different results. It's really simple. You don't need to be able to code or anything like that. It's literally you just drag and drop and type in your content and add your pictures, and away you go. Um, yeah, so that's gamification. Oh, yeah, and so drawbacks. Can it lead to fatigue? Can it lead to unethical behavior? I think we've talked about all of those. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and hand back to Kashmira. Yeah, if, um, I mean, we were already talking, but if anyone has any specific questions for Keith or... No, just look, I'm looking forward to looking at um, Genially and um, HP5, though. They look really interesting. H5P. Thank you. Yeah. HP. H5P. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really good. But um, 
it, it's very limited, uh, uh, Keith. I mean, I, uh, I just whole rem revamped the whole uh, career and employability you know, website for University of Sydney. Uh, I had a lot of fun, like creating images and doing things, but it's very limited. You can't do a few things and, you know, like even branching scenario and all that. Um, genially, I'm, I used, but it's like, I have not used it like to the full potential. Like I know H5P like in and out, but um, genially I'm not. H5P.com is much better than H5P.org. There's two different versions of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but both of them are yeah, pretty have, ugly. Yeah, I have the subscription, so. Okay. Yeah, but it's it's very limited, like in terms of special editing. So if you, ha you have a chart that you want to uh, do like image hotspot, say for instance, and if you have uh, nine things and if you want to add 10, then you have to go edit the picture and then upload the picture again and add the, it's, it's like very cumbersome, like processes and all that. But uh, yeah. it looks I think, nice. I agree with it. Yeah. Yeah. Looks nice. Uh, but a simple thing uh, such as uh, uh, fill in the blanks and all that uh, joy, like, um, yeah, we did something. Uh, so Keith, in, in UTS H5P, they have exemplars which you can copy. Uh, and, and there is one uh, I remember that is uh, sorting the rubbish. So you have like bins, like pictures of three beans, and then uh, you have lots of rubbish uh, on the top, and then you have to drag and drop into each other, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, if if you want, uh, I can uh, I can show you lots of HYPs. But genuinely, I'm not. So uh, one day, Keith, uh, you and me have a session, and you show me how to use it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think Abi has a question. Hey, Abi, what can I do for you? Hey. Yes, Keith, I just had a quick question. Would love to know your thoughts on um, like with AI and everything, and um, just with gamification. Where do you see? like the school system and education system heading like 10, 20 years down the line. Like, I would love to hear your thoughts as to what do you think where we are heading towards in terms of technology and everything. <laughs> this is where we're at, right? Um, and th this is getting into um, one of my real live research interests, you know, which is how do we design learning experiences that encourage young people to be active citizens when they don't have the opportunities to do that? You know, so how do we get young people, for example, to care about the environment or the Great Barrier Reef when, you know, most young people will never get to go to the Great Barrier Reef? Um, is there a way that we can use these new technologies to shape their their values, their knowledge, their attitudes mm -hmm. and their skills? And I think for a long time, <laughs> if you ever read the Horizon Report, the Horizon Report has been promising that virtual reality is here, okay, for about 20 years, and it's not here yet. It, it's closer than it's ever been. But I think that's only part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think if teachers and educational designers can find ways to leverage um, artificial intelligence in powerful ways to create personalised virtual reality environments, then I think we're suddenly in a really interesting space. Mm. You know, so so imagine, you know, Georgia, Arby and Joy are, are in, in my class and Ruma and, you know, there's, there's, there's and, and 30 other people. And if you're in a virtual reality environment, even if it's a shared virtual reality, so we're all in the same environment and it's a persistent environment, it's still really hard to design a learning experience for that, right? Because, you know, Arby, you might be looking over in that direction and want to wander off over there and Joy wants to go over there and someone else wants to go over there. How do you teach for that? And you don't want to say, hey, pay attention to me because you might as well be doing that in a classroom, right? You know, so you've got to, you've got to make use of the, the technology. So if you can use AI to ensure that everybody has that personalised learning experience and, and that experience meets them where they're at, so, you know, Joy gets something that just Joy needs and you get something that just you need to take the next step, then I think we're in a really powerful spot. So I think the answer to your question to sum up is more design, perhaps less teaching. Yeah. And now it sounds like I'm trying to sell you all, come and do my grad cert learning design. I'm not, okay. <laughs> but you did, actually. <laughs> It is a good course. It's won awards. <laughs> yeah. 
but you know, Keith, I mean, and, and I know that it's, it's kind of like a counterintuitive um, when, when I say that, but that's, that's my experience as a, uh, as a child as well, that, uh, so in, in ancient India, there was a, a, a system of like, a, it's like a ashram where you go, uh, when you are like seven or eight, you go to a, a guru's ashram, which is like somewhere in the middle of wherever that is, and stay away from parents, and you live there, and everything that like you have a one teacher school and it's like a huge family whatever that is and and his own who will be teaching you like language maths uh you know archery everything i mean like all the weaponry uh, art of weaponry writing everything uh but i mean apart from i mean i'm not bringing metaphysical aspects in it like uh, saying that okay there will be uh, they were able to manifest something blah blah but what i'm trying to say is that there was no teaching and learning material no equipment no ai no we are nothing right and they were still a very 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 capable um in doing what they were doing and memory, mathematics, um, uh, and they were like, it's not that, okay, I am a, a language student, so sorry, I wouldn't know like uh, what is 30% of two, uh, 325, because, oh, I'm not good at mathematics. It wasn't like that, because, you know, uh, they were kind of like a really expert, and, and there was nothing that um, they can, like, uh, there was no recording that they can revisit, uh, you know, like, and and still it happened. And as a child, like we, we didn't have any teaching learning material uh, in like blank, like nothing that would, except the blackboard in the classroom. And we were sitting on the floor and that did yeah. not stop me from learning anything that I wanted. So sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm going back to that, uh, 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 what Peter Gray said in that uh, free to learn book that he wrote. And, I exactly remember it's in, uh, towards the end of chapter five, he says that, you know, freedom to learn is the, is the key. So you don't give lots of lots of in instruction to them to do what uh, they have to do, or, or it's not supposed to be very tech heavy environment, but people can find their own way to learn things that they are interested in rather than they're pushed towards. Uh, it's, and, and why I'm, I'm kind of like tending to say this at this stage is that today I've received a, an email from one of the students, which is currently just like uh, learning at the moment with me. And, and he said to me that um, I have not submitted my assignment just because uh, I don't feel like it. And because I want to be a teacher, I have to be, uh, do this unit, but it doesn't feel like it is related and this and that, and I had to, kind of talk to him and say, look, this is how it is related. So you have to be convinced first and then I can help you, you know, um, in, in whatever way that you want. So I think it's just, uh, sometimes I'm thinking, where is it all going to go and where is it going to stop or at all? And, you know, uh, are we losing our like a very e e inherent capacity to kind of learn without things and we are kind of like a um, disabled that we need always, you know, some sort of support to be able to uh, forward our thinking rather than just you know be kind of but no you you you've hit on something that troubles me and it's related to the chat gpt debates that are going on at the moment you know yeah we we, we have got so focused on credentialing and accreditation and little bits of paper that say we've learned something that sometimes we forget about the actual learning yeah. <laughs> and the value um, of it actually yeah, yeah. And I have and, to go because I have to do a podcast. But oh um, my god, what time now? Just now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got my book. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Keith. Thank uh, you. I everyone. really appreciate you spending time for us. Thank you, Keith. Have a great and all the best with the rest of your studies. And Kashmir, always a pleasure to talk to your class. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Next year, maybe if Thank I'm you. teaching. <laughs> Okay, so yep, if you have any questions, I'm still here. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I will.